Hi there, it's Kate Gunning, host of the CMO Show with Kate Gunning. That's me. I'm really excited about my guest today. It's Carrie Palin. She's the CMO of Cisco. And let me tell you, she's got some chops. Chops when it comes to understanding business and real chops when it comes to being a most tremendous people leader. I am so grateful for the opportunity to have sat down with her and I am so inspired by our conversation and I know you're going to be too. So listen in and enjoy. Hey guys, it's Kate Gunning, host of the CMO show. And I'm really excited to be joined today by Carrie Palin, who's the CMO of Cisco. Hey, Carrie. Hi there. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Awesome. Good. Awesome. I'm I'm so glad to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Likewise. It's a beautiful Friday in Austin, Texas. It's a beautiful muggy Friday. (laughs) Right. The kind where you want to wear a sweater because it's December, but it feels a little sticky. That's right. Yes. Yes. I'm sticky through this blazer, but it's okay. (laughs) We're in the AC right now, That's so right. we'll be okay. It's all good. Yeah, so thank you for having having um, the morning with us. We yeah, really appreciate my, it. My pleasure. Tell me, your CMO of Cisco, Yeah. how long have you been there? What are you up to? About 20 months. I was just making that calculation, mm-hmm. and it's been busy. It's, uh, yeah. you know, when you're a, a Fortune 100 company, there's, there's a lot to go do, and especially one like Cisco, where we're in the midst of a lot of major transformation sort of into our next chapter. And I'm a builder. I love to build. So I love being here right now. And it's, it's, uh, but just doing that at scale presents probably more challenges than when you're not at scale, for instance. And so uh, we've been eyeball deep in digital and replatforming websites and <laughs> building demand engines and bringing in some of the demand engines from companies we've acquired. I mean, then looking at the brand and modernization of that. So there's lots to go do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sounds like it. It's good for a builder like you then. Yeah. 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 It's fun. What's the vision for Cisco mm. right now? Well, um, you know, we like to say that Cisco was the first to connect the world. Um, and we were, which is really cool. Um, and, and as such, our next chapter is about protecting that. Um, we're big, big time into cybersecurity. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are doing a ton in the application space. So observability and applications and software. Um, we're almost 50% software and services these days, which I think a lot of people aren't aware of. Wow. So the transformation is real. It's happening. Um, and we have lots going on. We're doing a ton in the uh, collaboration space as well with our WebEx product. So yeah, we are, we are telling, you know, we've connected the world, but now we're protecting it and we're still connecting it in different ways. Um, and that's pretty cool and exciting, especially in this day and age where security really matters. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's very powerful. And you're a tech girl. Yes. 28 yeah. years of it. 28 whole years. <laughs> so yeah. tell me, can you give us a couple of highlights, a few of the, the tech companies that you've worked with and then, yeah. but do that and then Help me understand how you can kind of compare some of the companies you've worked with historically to the company that you're in now. And like, what's the biggest difference that you're feeling right now where you are? I think the big theme in my career is I spent 17 years at Dell. And so I really grew up there, which is in so many ways great. Um, But I didn't know what I didn't know outside of that company. So then I did a big hard pivot into I wanted to go learn about SaaS. I started at IBM for a year um, with a sort of incubated SaaS group there, which was awesome. And we put the first offerings on their Bluemix platform. And then I moved to Silicon Valley and went eyeball deep in with 31-year-old founder CEO, high growth SaaS publicly traded companies. So Box. Then I went to SendGrid, which was acquired by Twilio. And then lastly, Splunk, uh, which is about a little over 2 billion in revenue, um, also in the security space um, and data analytics, and then went to Cisco from there, which I never really thought I'd go back to Fortune 100, but I'm so thrilled to be here. And I think if I could give you a little nugget from each place, I would say Dell taught me so much about being a business person first, a marketer second, Mm -hmm. really understanding the P&L, understanding our contribution to it, being very data-driven, um, there's a discipline there that is just sort of unparalleled. And I think um, it gave me the breadth of experience to then move into IBM taught me SaaS, which was amazing. I got to work for 42-year-old founder CEO 
that sold his company to IBM and he's amazing. Um, and then box, I got to work for one of the coolest founders in the Valley. Um, and he, you know, he started this company and just was a brilliant mind and one of the, one of the most interesting leaders I've ever worked for. Um, and then I learned really about born in the cloud SaaS there, which was a totally different experience. And then in SendGrid, I worked for probably the best servant leader I've ever worked for, mm -hmm. um, a guy named Samir Delakia, and he taught me in a very short amount of time there before we got acquired what that really looks like uh, to lead as a servant. And then I moved to Splunk, and it was awesome, just this high growth crazy, you know, we were 2 billion and growing 30% plus year over <laughs> year. Wild. It's wild. Um, yeah. And when I got there, it was, you know, over 10 years old and, and the CEO wanted to rebrand the company. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that when you're on this, you know, you're already 2 billion in revenue, but the world doesn't really know who you are. And so that was an amazing experience. And then now at Cisco, it's like taking all these lessons and applying those at scale and helping Cisco become more SaaS-like, more agile. Mm -hmm and modernizing our incredibly iconic, wonderful brand that may not be quite as relevant to Gen Z and millennials who are going to be 75% of our employee cohort as well as our buying cohort in two years. Yeah, and if there's security involved, that's mission critical for a lot of reasons. That's right. That's, that's awesome. Right. Across everything that enterprises do. Mm-hmm. 100%. So, yeah. Well, that's great. Thank you for what you're doing. And it's exciting. Okay. And I can't wait to see what happens in the next 20 months. Thank you. I'm excited too. Yes. There's lots coming. Yes. So the CMO show is all about who we are, like really at the core who we are, the real and the raw who we are, and what makes us great as people and as CMOs. So I'm really curious to get into somebody like you who's had such an impactful career working in so many really important tech oriented companies. Mm -hmm. And you talked about the sort of variety that you learned in each mm -hmm. and given all of that perspective that you have and sort of thinking about the last 28 years, I think you said, do you, what do you feel is your real CMO superpower today? And then I'm really curious mm -hmm. too, if you can share, do you feel like that's evolved over the years? Is it, is it something that's always been, or is it new and you've sort of learned into it or? Yeah. So it's interesting there. I don't think there's one in, and by the way, <clears throat> I don't look at myself as having superpowers. So it's weird <laughs> to have this. That's a weird thing to say. So I asked some of my team too, but I think the thing that consistently comes up is I'm a people first leader. I really believe in healthy, happy teams. It's not about me. It's about the leadership team, the captains that I put on the field. Mm -hmm. And that is my full-time day job is making sure that I hire the right people. I really, more importantly, give them the space and the grace to, and the psychologically safe environment to go do their best work. And then make sure that that team is actually really working inner, the inner workings of that team are healthy, right? Are we accountable? Are we transparent? Do, are we in each other's corners when things get tough, right? Are we, are we grinding through the hard issues? Are we operating efficiently? Are we giving each other space to be humans outside of work? All those things that make great teams. Uh, I think that's my superpower is that I love building and cultivating and growing human beings and seeing them reach their best potential together. That's beautiful. So I, I love that. And I think that sort of defined my career. And I will say also the other thing my team always laughs about, <laughs> I'm a very decisive person. Mm -hmm. I think CMOs have to make quick decisions yeah. and they have to make sure that there's huge stakeholder alignment when they do. And that is a full-time day job outside of our day job because marketing is so hub and spoke. Everybody in the company needs a piece of it. Yes. You have so many stakeholders. And if you aren't constantly managing that and expectations – um, it can be, it can go sideways very quickly. So I'd say those are the things that sort of have made my, my career. That's beautiful. I really appreciate you sharing that. And the people yeah. part is really tricky. And I'll yes. say as a newer CMO, so I'm 37, I got my first CMO job when I was 33 Congrats. and I was like, WTF, how do I do <laughs> What do I do? How right. does this work? Like, I, right. I can't do this. I'm not equipped for this. And they're like, yeah, you are. You're, you've got this girl. But I'm like, ah, right. I don't know. So I just want to say to our listeners, look, especially if you're early on in your CMO journey, figuring out for the first time ever how to structure a team, empower a team, be graceful with a team, encourage a team, right? Like yes. that can be really threatening. Yes. So we want to hear from you if you are 
new in your journey or not, and that's something that you're struggling with and you need tips or you want to share perspectives, I think it's a very important topic. So please do share Kate at cmoshow.com. And I'm sure Carrie will be happy to answer any follow-up questions. But like, look, I really appreciate you bringing that up because I think that the people part of our business is like, we're in the business of emotion, Right. Yes. Right. Yes. So if we're not sharing empathy with our teams and encouraging people to sort of safely right. be productive and safely be a little bit like, hey, I'm not sure about this, then it's very hard. It's very hard. And also, I will say, like, we're all humans and we're we don't always do everything perfectly. And so yeah. it's also my job and your job that if there's a toxic human in the mix or yes. if there is a toxic dynamic, we have to address it. And that's uncomfortable and hard yeah. and, and it doesn't get any easier, but that is our job. Yeah. Right. Like we have to get on top of that or else the greater good of the entire team goes south very, very fast. Yes. And so that's something that uh, getting comfortable being uncomfortable and do, doing those things with empathy and kindness, but also with a level of firmness that's like, hey, this is an acceptable behavior or decision making. And we need to we need to course correct. Mm hmm. Absolutely. I'd love to talk about goal setting. Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah. Because you mentioned the analogy about captains, right? Like thinking about the people on your team as captains that you're putting on the field. So right. I'm really curious if you can share a little bit about how do you think about goal setting on your team, people helping people stay accountable. Mm-hmm. Just talk us through, talk us through what that looks like if we're on Carrie's team. Mm. So, uh, number one, everybody wants too much for marketing. Every (laughs) CEO I've ever worked for is, I'm like, what does great look like in the next year? And they give me lists. It's like 8,000 things. Do you hear us CEOs? We hope you do. (laughs) And I, you know, respectfully will say that's not doable. Can you please pick three? (laughs) Literally less than five and it should be two or three. And then we, then it's our job. So my job is that negotiating negotiation upward and outward. So make sure the ELT at your company Mm -hmm. are aligned on what they need and that there is a final decision made in that room because every ELT member can't need three things from you, right? Totally. Because your team can't be superhuman. And then you take those corporate level goals and you say, all right, what can marketing do to affect that? And then you, it's, it's like, I, I don't like using this term necessarily, but it's, it's like a cascading, uh, OKR, right? Mm-hmm. You have to have the objective. And then what are the key results that say we're hitting the mark, we're not hitting the mark. And so what I typically do with my team is we have three, maybe four for a fiscal half key of, like objectives. Mm-hmm. And we all agree to them. We all make sure that everybody in the marketing org can see themselves in it, mm-hmm. right? That nobody's, that everybody aligns to that somehow. And then we do two or three key results per, per objective. And that is it. And then the ones that actually can be measured through data, we have the next click down and we have a dashboard that we mm-hmm. review, review weekly with my leadership team. Great. We cascade that. We red, yellow, green it so we make sure we're on track. And the only things we really dig into are the reds. And by the way, the, the atmosphere is red is good. Yeah, red, red is, is learning. Red is celebrated. We are yeah. learning about this. We never fry people for red. Good. And if it's all green, then I'm not trusting my leadership team is actually metric- metricing ourselves in a way that we're being accountable to the business. We're not pushing hard enough. So red is great. Yes. Red's how we get better. Good. I love that. So that's a probably a week or a month in the life of Carrie's team. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I'm grateful to be on Carrie's team right now. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie, uh, for joining us for this. Yeah. So I can feel that feel that. Um, so yes. Okay. We're normalizing red in the red, amber, green charts, everybody. That's right. I love that. Share your red with us. That yeah, we're celebrating fun. red. I yeah. mean, I literally sometimes have been at companies where we give out an award quarterly for the people who brought the biggest, gnarliest problem to the front yeah. forefront and tried to solve it. That's great. I love so. that. I love that. Okay. Let's get our team CMO community sharing their reds and how you're solving it. Yeah. I think that'd be really fun to learn from each other. Right on. Way. Yeah. Right on. All right. So <clears throat> not because red sucks, red's awesome, but next <laughs> I, I want to segue into what you think you do suck at. Uh. Um, what's your, what's <laughs> your, what's your amazing red thing that you, that you're excited about because you can either figure out how to improve upon it or find people who can help you with it. Yeah. Isn't it funny that when you say superpower, <laughs> it makes me so uncomfortable. Well, when you say what you suck at, I'm like giddy. I'm like, oh, I've got <laughs> a like, list yay. a mile long. That's because you celebrate <laughs> red, Carrie. That's why. We celebrate red. <laughs> Okay, so back to what I suck at. Uh, first of all, I'm terrible at email. I know that sounds trite, <laughs> but literally things will sit. I, I just can't get to We don't have enough hours in the day. No, we don't. And 
at this level, people need you on every channel in every way at all times. And you're sitting in meetings all day. It's impossible. And so I just have learned to be really clear on what my communication love language is with my team. Good. And anybody who needs me, I'm like, hey, here's my mobile phone number. <laughs> if you need me and it's urgent, you text me. Mm -hmm. Text me. I'm usually sitting in meetings. I will immediately respond um, unless I'm in the shower or I'm putting my kid to bed. I will respond to you or dead asleep. And if something's urgent in my inbox, let me know. And then I surround myself with people that can help me because I'll, I'll sit on WebEx teams and literally message with people all day. I just don't then toggle into my inbox because I want to be present in the meetings that I'm in all day Absolutely. long and focus on looking at the people in the eye that I'm talking to on WebEx and what have you. So where I stink and, and I'm not great at that, but where I, I try to be really clear on that and tell people, Hey, I've not cracked this nut. So if your love language on communication is email, mm -hmm. let's talk about how we can do that, right? If this is urgent to you, when you send me emails in the actual subject line, say, yes. Carrie, look at this now, colon, whatever, and put it in exclamation, send it with urgency. I will get, get it done. Yeah. So we try to like bridge that gap. I also, and this is going to sound really funny. I suck at typing. I never took a typing class, mm -hmm. which actually affects every aspect of my ability to communicate via anything that you type, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like my mom in high school is like, take a typing class. I was like, no, oh, I don't need typing. That's amazing. And she was right. Um, so <laughs> I am really typically, I over rotate on in person and voice communication. I love calling people and really talking about things. Me too. Right? Like I love hearing voices. I think you, you see so much more in voice inflection and body language when you're with people. Mm -hmm. So I try to shy away from, but it's also because I really suck at typing. And I will say the other thing is I get very wed to people. Mm. And this is the bigger thing. And I will find sometimes that I have to, I have to be careful about not over rotating on missing blind spots on the people that I just love to pieces. Um, and, and, and to create an environment where they can give me feedback on my blind spots, right? Because that's how you continue to grow. And it's sometimes uncomfortable and not easy. And when you, when you have been with people a long time, you tend to think everything about them is perfect or every way yeah. they operate is perfect. And they think that about you and we're doing each other a disservice by not, by not speaking truth. Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's great. So a couple things, mm -hmm. I think we have the same communication, love languages. So awesome. I'm just going to publicly say that I think I'd like Carrie to be my, my coach. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am such a fan of texting. I tell people that all the time. I get so overwhelmed by Slack. I think yeah. it is just such an amazing asynchronous tool, Yeah, but it overwhelms the crap out of me because I similarly am like, okay, I'm trying to be really present. I'm trying to think I'm trying to create and trying to make, and I'm just ping, 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 right? It's like right. very overwhelming. And I love sending audio texts. They're my very favorite. Right. My team, my whole team has always know like, oh, you're going to get these. When you join Kate's team, you're going to get this weird thing. It's going to be a text, but it's going to be a voice memo. <laughs> so it's like become a joke, a running joke. But it's so personal. It's so personal. It's like yes. it's so much more efficient than type, 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 typing away. Yes. So. And people can I'm understand you. your intent when they have voice yeah. behind it. Yeah. It's actually, it's funny, not funny, but interesting, like. Um, millennials are the first generation to grow up with music in their ears at all times. But as a consequence, I've seen over and over, and I had this conversation with our new creative agency. It is a distinct brain language. Like audio is actually in some ways more powerful with millennials, including voices than the visual is because of how they grew up. Totally. And so we're rethinking how we're taking our brand to market as a consequence, yeah. but it matters. Voice Voices matter. Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me then in this context or other, you can pick, what do you think is the marketing that you've done that's mattered the most because it's been your biggest win? Or since you love reds, you can answer this question in the inverse. It can be your biggest <laughs> flop if you prefer, but uh, I'm curious what you feel like that is. Well, I'm really excited about the stuff we're doing at Cisco right now, but some of it hasn't hit the mark yet. So I'll, I'll hold on that. <laughs> Lips sealed, we'll get you back and you can uh, talk about that when it's It's down. coming and our security, <laughs> our new security ad literally hit last week in the, uh, the college football, uh, playoffs. So, um, in the, in, thank you. We played it in the big 12, uh, playoff in the pack 10, awesome. um, pack 12. Anyhow, long story short is I would say the biggest success and frankly, the biggest risk, um, was when I joined Splunk, my CEO said, look, we need to rebrand. Mm -hmm. And we've been working on it with an outside consultant. We've got the phrase, 
but we don't really know what to do with it. <laughs> and I was like, okay. okay. And I was like, what's the phrase? Because it was Splunk and Splunk is a data insights company and they're so awesome. But but he said at the time it was, um, listen to your data was the tagline, which was interesting, but passive. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, look, we now are doing all these things past just listening to our data. We're not just a log file company. We're doing security and we're doing um, observability and those ones observability is becoming a thing in tech. And mm-hmm. he said, how do we tell that story? He's like, basically, so the phrase we've come up with is data to everything. And I was like, you know, I kind of gave him the radio shack dog. I cocked my head. I was like, what? I, I, I don't totally get it. Am I, am I missing something? He's like, well, the concept is bring data to everything. And I was like, like every decision, every question, every mm-hmm. problem. And he was like, yes. And I was like, okay, that's actually kind of cool. Like broaden the scope of you've got to have data to make great decisions, yes. right? Like every leader, every business, like you you make better decisions through data. And I was like, okay. So my team started working with that, right? And we came back with some pretty crazy ideas. Like, hey, our company colors are black and green. Let's rebrand mm-hmm. to bright magenta and neon orange. Yeah. It looks beautiful, by the way. Oh, thank you. No, listen, the, I mean, the, look, at first, when I said that to our board of directors, you know, they looked at me <laughs> like I had eight eyeballs. There were a couple of them in the room who were like, yes, but our CEO got it. But the reason we did that, it was intentional. This is one of the risks, but it was intentional. And even our head of engineering product, I loved him. I still do love him, but he was like, I hate pink. And I was like, got it. He's like, don't make me make the product pink. And I was like, I'm not asking you to do that. The reason we're doing this is we don't have a ton of budget. Yeah. And if you look at tech brands. They're all blue. The vast majority <laughs> are blue and green or yeah. turquoise or something. And when you're driving down a highway in Silicon Valley going 90 miles an hour, mm-hmm. everything is blue. It's the sea of sameness, right? Yeah. Or if you're walking through Grand Central Station, same thing. Or flipping through Bloomberg or HBR, it's the same thing. How do we stand out? We wanted to have this flash of something different and this heat that drew people to it that would catch your eyeballs and it did just that right it wasn't because pink's my favorite color and my team thought of this and I was like yes I'm supportive and we tweaked the pantones forever (laughs) but it worked yeah you gave spunk some spunk yeah and then our tagline changed to something that was actually had more heat to it too which was turn data into doing yeah good. and that was it people were turning data into doing and the biggest risk was we had a rebranding moment where we had an event with CEOs in the Valley. And we invited a bunch of CEOs, like 200 CEOs. And we, I was, my team was, and I was incredibly convicted that the speaker we needed at that was uh, former President Barack Obama. And it was not, it was not a political statement, but he was the first president to ever really use data to open up data and to open up data sets to uh, big communities in the United States around healthcare and other things. And so he used data to lead. And so yeah. who better to talk about on that scale, bringing data to every problem, every decision, every everything. But he hadn't accepted any invites to the Valley since he had left his presidency. Oh, wow. And I walked into the board meeting and said, Hey, we're we going to get him to, we're going pink and orange. <laughs> and this event, we've set the date and it's in three months and we're going to get Barack Obama. And at first, you know, I had to explain it's not political. Yes. They all understood that. And then they're like, is he going to accept? And we said, we're going to get him. We're going to write the greatest ask. And it's with his team. And we're going to keep six weeks before the event. He said, yes. That's amazing. It was amazing. And I just I w- got chills. You can't see them guys, but I have them. Had he not, it would have <laughs> been the shortest tenure for Splunk CMO in history. Mm-hmm. But, but we made this bet and he shows up and I mean, he was riveting. That's amazing. And he took and, and the press was all over it. And it was just beautiful because what we had been fighting for and so hard for, like what data means in this new world order and how Splunk paid a, played a part in that, all of a sudden became so relevant on this big stage and there were like 270 discrete articles written about it and he was amazing. So, so it, was a, it was a cool moment. Sorry, it was a long story, but hopefully it was worth it. But that was, it was a lot of risk, but, and there was so much more to that there too, but it ended up like, I'm so proud of the team. It wasn't me, it was our team. Mm-hmm. But it was a lot of people, brilliant minds, hard work that had the courage to really do something different. I really appreciate you sharing that. And the learning that I'm feeling as you're speaking about it is taking risks just for the hell of it doesn't make so much sense. But when you do and it's extremely relevant because of the strategy that you have. And it goes back to, I think, the alignment that you talked about, right? Yes. There's a handful of things you know you're working towards. There is a clear strategy in place. And there are certain risks that it always makes sense to take if they work within the confines of that 
very important box, right? That's you right. can be out of the box when you have a clear box. That's right. So I think that's really powerful. That's my takeaway. And I was just thinking while you're speaking that like this is a really important reminder for people. It's very inspiring. And the way that you take risks as marketers doesn't always have to feel like it's extremely provocative, right? right. It can be really decisive and thoughtful, yes. right? And therefore very powerful. So thank you for sharing that. Oh my gosh. And, and let me just say this. I'll, I'll leave with this. Taking risks when they're calculated and thoughtful, but having conviction around them. Yes. And then I was fully prepared to, if this doesn't work, I'll own it. Yeah. I'll take that bullet. But we have to, we have, and by the way, I'll give Christopher Lockhead a little credit on this too. He's the guy who came up with the phrase and was helping us on the sideline. He was like, hey, go big, right? Yeah. He, he's one of the authors of Play Bigger, but like he oh, said, look, yeah. he said, look, go big here. And, and he gave us the courage to say, all right, let's do it. And then we had a ton of support from our board. Once we said, hey, we firmly believe this is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. They got behind us, our exec team did. Um, and we felt the weight of that and, and they were, that they were all in our corner and it gave us the courage to just go hard at the market and it, and it all worked out. That's great. Yeah. Did you get any insight from President Obama's team about what it was that got their attention? Mm. And so they made them reply. No, but I will say this. They, they did allude to the fact that this was a topic that he personally said, I'm interested in this. And they mm -hmm. said, you know, we're not talking about politics. We're not. Yeah. And this is 2019, the fall of 2019. We said, yeah, we don't want to. Um, here are the things we want to talk about. And then we talked, there are some really great moments where <laughs> our CEO just talked to him about being a dad because he had just dropped off his second mm. daughter at yeah. college. And here he was. And he just said, look, you know, I, I'm still a human being. And he said, I started tearing up and I had to walk out in the hallway. So I did not embarrass her in front of her friends, her freshman year in college. Yeah. And I'm sitting there with my child in my lap who is lucky enough to join the event on oh, the second row awesome. and thinking, this guy's he's just like all of us. He just happened to lead the free world for a while. Yes. But, 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 but he just, he zips his pants the same way. He loves his <laughs> child the same way. Like presidents, they're just like us. <laughs> I mean, but regardless of your politics, right? I mean, yeah. he's an exceptionally smart guy, but mm -hmm. it was neat to see that, that this humanity and that was special about it too. But seeing him talk about how, you know, having to jump on that stage so quickly from not having a role that was quite as big coming into it. Yeah. Data helped him figure out things for his team and for him. He's like, look, when it, when something hits my desk, that means layers of incredibly brilliant people mm -hmm. couldn't make a decision, which means it's going to be really hard. Yes. And there's no great answer, but having data to help you make those decisions at least gives you a little comfort that it's the best of the bad answers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's true. I mean, I, I, you're in your job, in my job, yeah. I've got a host of smart people on my team, way smarter than me, that mm -hmm. if the decision was easy or even remotely, okay to make, they would have done it. it. It's the hard stuff that finally hits our desks. And we have to make judgment calls sometimes. I mean, mine isn't, you know, leading the free world. It's, yeah. I mean, the CMO of a Fortune 100 company, it's a little different in scale and, and magnitude, but mm -hmm. still you want to make good decisions. And, and I look at data every day and use that to make the best decisions we can for the team and for the company. Yeah. Can you talk about a scenario, if it's applicable, where you've made a decision that was different than the data, but you maybe felt like, oh, I just feel like in my gut, I need to go this other way or a contrarian perspective. Cause I think about that a lot too. Like yeah. often when ideas are really good, they're very polarizing. Like half the board tables. Yes. Almost like with the magenta and yellow, maybe like half of them were like, cool, we dig it. We're into it. Maybe yeah. the other half were like, no fucking way. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, no, there were like, some. How do you, how do you navigate that? Cause you've got a lot of cred being 28 years into doing this. And I think it's helpful maybe for people to hear from you about like being decisive, but also trusting yourself if specifically there's conflict. Like how do you, how do you think about that? Oh, so the conflict thing. Yeah. Uh, so let's go back to that Splunk example. Cause I think yes. this is great. Okay. Um, the, the half, the, I would say a third of the board were like, Ooh, pink, orange. <laughs> and when, and I, I fully understandable, if I'd been yeah. sitting in their seats, I would have said, hmm, are yeah, you kidding? Like, I got you. That's very, that, that, that's, that's unique. Yes. Right. And it's right in your face, but I, we all anticipated that. And so what I asked my team to do was to make this big slide uh -huh. that was all these brands in tech yeah. and the blue Pantone or green Pantone that they were, and then put their logo in white mm. and these little squares just all next to each other. So it was literally all saturated with blue green. Yes. And then I stuck the Splunk in there with orange pink. Mm -hmm. And I put that up on the screen. 
as we were all debating, I said, let me show you this. Because I had said everybody's blue, 70%-ish. And there, you can say that logically. But yeah. When you see it. <laughs> That's awesome. Some people are visual learners, right? And I all am. of a sudden, they were just staring at the screen. They're like, oh. Mm-hmm. I said, right. Now, if we want to triple the budget to take this brand into market. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Let's go with blue. Or let's stay with green and black. That's fine. But mm-hmm. if we want to stand out with the budget we have, mm-hmm. this is... I I firmly believe in my heart of hearts and there's nothing to prove that magenta and orange are going to do this, right? It was a judgment call. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe and my team believes and our CEO believes that this is the right thing to do. And I said, and if it doesn't work, I'll own it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think people, when you do risky things, people want to know that someone's going to be accountable. Yes. So that's number. So that's a big one. Okay. Also remember that people learn in different ways and they get over the hump in different ways. So sometimes visually it helps to bring something with you that, or to prove it through data if you can or whatever, but people learn in different ways. If they're going to do something that's uncomfortable, yes. Help them get over the hump somehow. Understand what their decision-making love language is. Back to the love language thing, right? I like this love languages as it pertains to managing stakeholders. Yes. That's they decide good. differently. They learn yeah. differently. So how do you do that? And then the accountability piece is huge, mm-hmm. right? You have to give them the, hey, yes, I firmly believe this. It, I've, we've looked at all the data. We've pressure tested it with customers. We've done all the homework. But yeah. at the end of the day, this could miserably fail. And if it does, I will own that. That's great. Okay, so taking risks is possible. Yes, Yes. And two key factors of that for you have been accountability, who's going to own it if it flops, mm-hmm. and understanding the decision maker's love languages so that you can try to get them over the hump That's right. if needed. That's awesome. And the third, I would say, sorry, you uh, always, you have to have courage. Yeah. This stuff yeah. just requires courage. Totally. And And I don't say that lightly. It took me two thirds of my career to figure out how to have that level of courage. Absolutely. And I still work on it. Yeah. I mean, look, having courage is really, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you need to, but it's really scary. And I'll speak just from personal experience. I told you my first CMO position was when I was 33. I was working on wall street. I felt like a monkey on wall street. I'm like, I'm a kid. I'm a, like a really flowery, excitable girl. Like, (laughs) you know, and then like you want to make a recommendation that feels bold and you know that you've thought it through that the data don't lie and that you know what you're talking about. But like, you know, being courageous, it's tricky. And like, especially if you've kind of got this other sort of thing in your psyche, like, okay, but I'm like the youngest one in here and I'm the least experienced at the table in this category and, 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 and like you can come up with all the reasons why you shouldn't be courageous, but you always should. But the thing I think that you're saying that's really important is be courageous, be thoughtful. That's right. Right. Like be thoughtful, think it through, have a, have a plan that says, Hey, I'm, I'm young and I'm courageous, but I'm also Thinking this through, right? That's right. That's, that's Does it make good business sense? To the best yes. of your ability, is the is it the right decision on behalf of the company? Right. It's stakeholders and your customers, or your if it's not a company, your organization, right? Mm-hmm. Are you thinking broadly, not just as a marketer, of right. what the impact's gonna be of these decisions if they're at that magnitude? Yes. And then and then and then go hard with courage, yeah. right? And be accountable. Coach Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> Can I call you Coach K? Yes, I okay. love that. It has a nice ring to it. <laughs> I like alliterations. So, so good. I really love it. So okay, good. amazing. I want to know, you hold so much wisdom. Who do you think in marketing? It could be a person or a platform or a whatever. Mm. Um, but who who do you learn from? Who in our network do you think is just like so smart mm. that you follow? Share with us. I made so many friends in the Valley that there was a hugely fraternal Mm -hmm. group of CMOs there. And I didn't anticipate that because I grew up in a one big fortune 50 company that was like, I just, I made all my friends inside the company. I didn't understand that CMOs would want to help each other out and, Mm -hmm. and really love on each other and give therapy to each other and all the things. (laughs) It was like, it is the, some people say it's the toughest role in the C-suite and we have one of the shortest tenures in the C-suite and there's Mm -hmm. there's a lot of anxiety and stress that comes with that, no matter how great you are at your job. Mm -hmm. And when I got to the Valley, my 31 year old founder CEO, Aaron Levy looked at me and said, Hey, 
I know you're new to this, so I thought I'd reach out to my network and get you set up with one-on-ones with my favorite CMOs. Oh, that's amazing. And so he reached out to like 15 CMOs. Mm -hmm. And I mean, everyone from Adobe to Cisco to Salesforce to all the others. And then it turns out that there were some moms with kids in my classes who were CMOs at other places and literally down the street, because on every street corner, people work for companies in the Valley. And so here I, I met all these people and they, 201, were so incredibly gracious and kind and warm and funny and empathetic and smart. And they became my squad. That's awesome. And I will say some of the key ones in that squad to this day, uh, Shannon Brayton, who was the CMO at LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, And she is now uh, doing PE work. And she's super smart, um, crazy funny. And she is still my go-to for when I just need I need a ear. I need someone to hear me out and help me kind of think through a tough situation. Or if I just need a hug, she's my (laughs) gal. Um, She's great. Jessica Jensen, who's the CMO at Indeed, another one of my favorites. Wicked funny, so smart, can toggle between different types of industries. Great leader. Same with Shannon. They both like have massive followings. And then the other person that I admire so much is uh, Ann Lunas at Adobe. Mm -hmm. Uh, She took that company through major transformation at scale. Um, and she's also like head of strategy product, I think these days because they sell marketing products really in MarTech. And, uh, she's just, she's wicked smart and great. All these ladies also great moms. My number one job is being a mom. I didn't really talk about that, but I have two kids who are the light of my life. So those three (laughs) women I, I would say are sort of like, they're my touchstone. That's amazing. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Hi, ladies. Hi. We'd love to have you on the show, too. Tell me how being a mom's impacted you as a CMO. Oh, it's changed everything. Yeah. I literally, I literally, my I was late to leadership in my career because I, I avoided it like the plague for the longest time. Like, didn't want to do it. Didn't think it was worth it. Wanted to just be the greatest individual contributor around. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, one of my really good mentors is like, yeah, I'm kicking you out of the nest. Like when you get back from maternity leave from your first kid, you're going to have to interview for these director roles at Dell. Mm-hmm. And I, he was like, I say this with love. <laughs> it is time. Yeah. And he was like, and frankly, I think your superpower is leading. And I said, how do you know that? I don't. He's like, yes, but I see you influence without authority all the time. And frankly, lead with empathy. And we need more leaders like you. And he was like, so I've put your name in the hat for two different jobs and you need to earn one of them, but go figure it out. That's awesome. And right when he did that, I was like, uh, I'm, I'm like pregnant. eight months pregnant. No, I was like eight. I was huge. Oh, I was God. eight months pregnant. And I was like, I've got a month to figure this out before I go on maternity leave for three months and come back. Right. It was like that quick. And so I kind of got forced into that with motherhood at the same time. Yes. And man, it's humbling. Yeah. Both of them are humbling. Like I, I was, and I had my first kid at almost 39 years old. So I was sort of what I thought was a fully formed adult. Mm -hmm. Um, Not so much. And my (laughs) kids, I will say this, my kids are the light of my life and my husband too. Um, It's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, but it has changed me. I mean, I think I've always been a really empathic human, empathetic human. I lead through understanding people. I try to, Mm -hmm. Um, but having children changed how I look at when I see people at the workplace who have just had kids or maybe adopted a child or maybe are going through something, taking care of an aging parent, but I can see the fatigue in their eyes. Yes. Like I just noticed that more readily these days. Does that make sense? It totally does. Um, And understanding that everybody puts in the work differently. Mm -hmm. I think the pandemic helped everybody understand that too a little bit better, but having children really changed and broadened that aperture for me and that people go through things. And the other thing I'd say is after my second child, I had a very kind of caught me off guard bout of postpartum anxiety came from out of the blue and I just made it to what they call executive director at Dell, which got restriped to being most of them a vice president at Dell. So it was like the big jump in my career. And they were offering, uh, they were offering packages for people who wanted to take voluntary severance that year. Mm. And on the last day to apply for it, like it was a week into that postpartum hitting like a brick wall. And I texted my boss and I said, Hey, I think, I think I'm, I think I'm going to take the package. I just need you to know, cause you need to approve it. And he was already gone for holiday break. He was in India with his family. And out of the blue in the middle of the night, he texts me back. And he's like, what the F are you talking about? He's like, what is going on with you? You've worked your whole career to get to this place. And you're doing great work. Like, why do you want to leave? I said, I don't feel great. It's the first time I said that out loud to someone other than my family. And I said, I've never felt like this, but I think I have postpartum. And he said, hey, I'm not a woman. I don't pretend to understand this. 
but I am one of your biggest supporters and I'm going to help you get through this and we need you here. And so let's figure out a plan to get you feeling better. This is temporary. This too shall pass. But like, I'm not going to let you walk away from your career dreams. And in that moment, it changed everything. And I think that that moment changed me too, that even though maybe not be a, a, you know, a a two month postpartum thing for someone, it may be something else and trying to truly understand that life has ebbs and flows and peaks and valleys. And even the most successful human being has had moments where they're brought to their knees and trying to be there for humans. And then when they're at their best, they give you 200% more than they could have ever thought because you are the person who stood behind them when they weren't. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. How many months postpartum were you when that happened, if you don't mind sharing? I was a couple weeks. Well, couple sorry. Weeks. So I was a few months, but I I just stopped. Sorry, I don't know if I could say this on the podcast, but I just stopped yeah. breastfeeding. My yeah. hormones took a massive shift. You can say that. So I didn't know about all this stuff, right? I just yeah. didn't understand that because it didn't happen with my first child. Absolutely. And it can be different. And so that's why you yeah. just don't know. You don't know. Um, and, you know, I look at, like, I sponsored the mental health, uh, you know, ERO organization at Splunk when I was there neurodiversity, because I believe so strongly in this during the pandemic, people who had never suffered from Mm -hmm. depression and anxiety and all these things, that level of stress triggered that in them. And close to half our population was struggling with something uh, on that order. And that means half of my employees on my team were. Mm -hmm. So how, how could I stand up and let them know that I was there for them? And part of that was, Hey, I want to exec sponsor this group. I want to be vocal. I want us to put, put marketing out on YouTube to highlight people who are splunkers, who are neurodiverse, right? Yes. And so how do we how do we as leaders understand people who maybe aren't struggling with the same things we are, mm-hmm. but we show them the love and the empathy that it's okay to be flawed. We all are. Yeah. Absolutely. Like I didn't get to this place because I was flawless. Mm-hmm. I'm the furthest thing from, and yet here I am. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate that. And I will share a personal anecdote too. I so I had my son Tillman when I was 30. And I got promoted to executive director at JP Morgan while I was on maternity leave. And I went back after 14 weeks, but I think I was probably at 20 weeks. So it was like a month and a half after being back. Mm -hmm. I could not get out of bed, just literally out of nowhere. Yeah. It freaked me out. I was crying constantly. It was yep. terrifying. And the whole thing only lasted for a couple of days, but it was so scary. And I really, I just want to say thank you to Jamie Calfus and Richard Chambers because they were my bosses, mentors, mm-hmm. and they made it so safe for me to call and say, Hey, I know I just got back four weeks ago. I need to take a couple days. I don't know what's going on, but I can't stop crying. (laughs) You know, like it's not because I'm really, you know, sad to be back. I'm so excited to be back. But like, gosh, I don't know what's going on. And so I just think it's, It's it's so powerful, though, to speak those words out loud, to share that with people, because it can feel very lonely and it's so scary. Can be. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And I feel like it's my obligation to do yeah, that. Yeah, right? I feel like that too. I'm like, I can't, I can't go to the next question without telling everybody. Me too. So many people have told well, me common. that they feel it. They've had a yeah. stint, or that happened too, or they were depressed yeah. because their mom was dying of cancer, or whatever yes. it is. Like, we yeah. all have our things, right? Yeah. And like, recognizing that and figuring out how to lead with compassion. It's not just empathy, but it's real compassion for yeah. maybe things you might not understand, like the gentleman who told me, "Hey." I'm not a woman. I've never had given birth. I can't imagine performing that kind of miracle. Like (laughs) y'all are in a different category, but I'm here to help you through this because I have seen your career and I know how much this means to you Mm -hmm. and I want to help you through this. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Thanks to all the gentlemen out there yes. who, who, help yes. us, who help try to understand when when we're having our, our female moments. Yeah. I mean, and, and by the way, guys have them too. Yeah, like there, it isn't exclusively female. That's we right. all have r- r- moments in our lives where we ebb and flow. Every this is a, is, a, it is a classically universally human thing. That's right. That's yeah. right. Cheers to being human, Carrie. Yeah. I appreciate your humanness. You bet. I see your humanness. <laughs> and I'm really grateful that there are people like you in the seat that you're in who are human, who are expressing it, and who are really proud of it and leading with not empathy, like you said, but compassion because they are very different things and we need yeah. that. Yeah. So does our next generation of marketing workers. So 
I really mm. appreciate that. I want to ask you one more question before yeah. we wrap up. And that is what trait do you think is imperative for every marketer to have? If there's one that you think is just like, just really important. Yeah. Right? What is that? I know this might surprise you. <laughs> Look, 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have said this. Okay. But the world has changed, yeah. especially in B2B marketing. Mm-hmm. Marketing owns some portion of the revenue in B2B companies now, and in some companies, all the revenue. Yeah. You have to understand the business. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're a creative and you're making the coolest brand campaign. Yes. You need to understand how that can potentially impact. What is the impact of what we do mm-hmm. on the P&L? Is it top line revenue? Is it awareness building and markets we have to break into? Whatever that is, understand the fundamentals of the business. And if it's not native to you, ask a finance friend to go to lunch and ask them all the questions mm-hmm. and tell them up front, I've got these five questions and, and start asking them or go listen to an earnings call. Yes. If you Ooh. work for a publicly traded yeah. company, listen to them religiously and write down the things you don't yeah. understand and then go ask somebody in finance or ask somebody who's, you know, a leader in marketing to explain it. But fundamental understanding of your business makes you so much more transferable um, and, and upwardly mobile. Yes. Uh, because you have to be a business leader that does that through marketing mm-hmm. versus being a marketer who sort of understands the business. In this day and age, you have to understand your business. That's great. I love that. And bonus for the Gen Z crew, you can listen to earnings calls on Twitter now. (laughs) Right. It's like they're making it really accessible for all of us. That's right. Right? That's right. It's fascinating. I joined a Twitter Spaces last week, and I was like, this is awesome, right? Like, I I wish that existed when I was working at JP Morgan, and I wasn't, like, trying to figure out how to access earnings calls. Accessibility (laughs) is such a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. And uh, and so it's at your fingertips, so go learn. Go challenge yourself to learn understand the business that you support. It, it will, it will make you so much, the trajectory of your career will take off when you understand the business and understand how your work impacts the business. And then you can proactively go seek to help solve problems in the business. Mm -hmm. You'll get noticed. Yes. Thank you, Carrie. Coach Carrie in the house, everybody. (laughs) I love it. I I love it. Thank you so much. It's been a delight. Absolutely. Great insight. Really appreciate having you here. Thank you.